Let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, Lord, you are the king of kings. You are God, almighty, wonderful, counselor. Lord, you've seen fit to create us. And though we fell, though we went astray, and although we left you, you sent your son that he could die for us. He bore our sins that we may have life. Lord, we thank you. We are grateful, and that is truly our thanksgiving. We love you and we need you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the scripture reading was in Deuteronomy 8, and we've been reading that perpetually throughout most of the year, right? Before it was Deuteronomy 6, uh, 4 through 8. Uh, now it is Deuteronomy 8, um, 1 through 3. And I hope that you, you look at these scripture readings and, and you study them out. You look at them. Um, quick recap here. The last two messages that we've had. Uh, when Pastor Sia has asked me to speak... Uh, in almost succession, in, in frequency this last time, uh, he gave me some counsel and he says, when I do that, I like to do it as a, uh, as a series. And so I've never really done that before, actually. Um, I just felt like everything the Lord put on my heart was a perpetual continuance. And so I really took that to heart. I said, okay, a series. That's wisdom. That makes sense. And then I thought, what if these were the last three sermons I ever preached? What would I build them up to? What sense would they make? How could I change my life and in the process, by God's grace, help a fundamental change in your own? So recapping the last two sermons and leading into this one. Although it's been titled and, and, and subtitled, the life, of Je uh, the life and Death of Jesus in You, the first message was Abiding in Christ. All right? And so uh, we covered abiding, and, and, and that very desire of God's was to abide in you and you in Him, and that He wanted your fruit to remain, that He wanted to take you from a branch on the vine, surviving, to a branch on the vine, thriving. Amen? And it required acceptance of His life-giving power. We illustrated how trying is not real. It's a false concept. You either love or you don't love. You either abide or you don't abide. You either love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your strength, and your soul, or you don't. The next one was the life and death of Jesus in you, and the subtitle was Kingdom Mentality. We covered the mentality needed for the radical idea of having faith. And within that, bless you, within that faith, within that struggle, if you will, of asking Jesus, yes, I believe. Help my unbelief. We ask the very real question, is God's love conditional? Do this and I will love you. I will bless you if you. Or is it unconditional? Meaning the love of God is without condition. Meaning He loves us without the condition that we first loved Him or that we will ever love Him. And so today's sermon title is, the subtitle is just Unconditional Love. Unconditional Love. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, and these were kind of the end verses that we looked at in that last sermon, kingdom mentality. First John chapter 4, verses 8 through 13. And so when Amanda came out here, um, I had this Bible study with her. So this, this sermon is, is largely based on that study, and realistically it's largely based on, on, uh, on my prayer and my study that God has convicted me with for my life 
over the course of the last two and a half months. Uh, and it's been a journey, church. And I, and I hope that this is a blessing to you. Verse 8. The one who does not, this is 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is what, church? God. Amen. By this the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through whom? Through Him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us, sent His Son to be the propitiation, the sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us His Spirit. Amen? Amen. Unconditional love. There's a story. Have you guys remember the story from 1990? This gentleman named Tony Toto. He lived in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Familiar? No, okay, well then let me share the story with you. It's a brand new revelation for you then. See, Tony uh, was considered kind of a ladies' man, okay? So picture that, a ladies' man. The problem with Tony being a ladies' man is that he was married, okay? So this is a real problem for Tony. And on top of that, his wife had gotten sick of it and had found another partner herself. See, he operated a pizza parlor there in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and Tony Toto survived five attempts on his life. Someone was trying to kill Tony, and it was all arranged or carried out by his wife, Frances, and her lover. Twice she arranged assailants to beat him over the head with baseball bats. He lived both times. On one occasion, she put a trip wire across the basement stairs in their house, hoping that he would trip over it and plummet to his demise. He survived. Twice she arranged for him to be shot. Bless you. The first time she drugged his chicken soup so that he would sleep soundly through it. I mean, she didn't hate him. She just didn't love him anymore. He was shot in the head and miraculously survived. The second time he was shot in the chest, surely this will do him in, but only sustained minor injuries. The true happy couple, right church? Well, she took to death to his part very seriously. Even more miraculous than Tony's survival was his attitude towards his wife once he found out she was responsible for all of it. Yeah. Tony, who was, again, a self-confessed ladies' man, said that he held his wife blameless. When she was found guilty and sent to prison for arranging his murder, he took their four children and visited her in jail every single week. Every week. When she was released from prison, she went back to their red brick home to resume her married life with Tony. With his arm around her being interviewed, Tony said, we're more in love now than ever before. I don't understand why people break up over silly little things. Puts it into perspective, right? I mean, how often do you fight over not taking the garbage out or doing the dishes? I mean, this guy was on the verge of death's doorstep five separate times. Friends, that's unconditional love. I mean, Tony got a wake-up call five times, right? I mean, let's put that out there. He wasn't without fault, amen? Right. And yet here they are, more in love than ever before. Interesting. There are three levels of love, church. Needy love. Needy love. A baby needs, he expresses it, and he gets them met. Amen? 
Now, I've read books where it says that, all right, because a baby cries because he needs food or he's wet and needs to be changed or has a blowout, whatever the case may be, either way he needs to be changed, that's selfish. And therefore, this little child, this infant, well, it's a sinner. Bad news for the baby. The baby just needs nurture and care. What do you say? Right, this is his expression so that he can receive love. Its needs are met. Needy love is a very immature and yet at the appropriate age, beautiful, right? Caring for a child is a wonderful thing, is it not? I mean, I personally don't like feeding them when they're sitting in the chair and they're throwing it back at you, but nevertheless, needy love is a beautiful thing in, in the right context. It has to mature into a different level of love. And realistically, church, there's really only two levels of love that exist after needy love, after you've went from that immature status to the mature status, right? And the Bible talks about maturing into that perfect love, amen? Transactional love. Most people in the world operate out of this level, okay? Track it with me here. I only love you as long as you continue to love me. Conditional love has conditions of reciprocation, right? Now, Tony understood what unconditional love was. He was not in transactional love with Francis. Unconditional love. We give and not look to get. It starts with God, then with you, and then with others. Right, so we looked at Deuteronomy 6 before, and God's call to us was to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, and your strength. Amen? And Jesus uh, piggybacked on that of the greatest commandments from Leviticus 19.18 and said very specifically that you should love your neighbor as what? Yourself. And so um, in the afternoon program a while back, I kind of looked at that. And so in Matthew 22, Matthew 22, Matthew chapter 22. So Matthew is the first book in the Bible of the New Testament, that is. So if you're in, in the scriptures, you want to go to the very first book in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 22, which is right after Malachi. Matthew 22, and we're going to be looking at verses 36 through 40. And so 36 says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all of what? With all of your, and with all of mind. Right. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. So Jesus is giving out extra credit, church. Amen? The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend, or hang, depending on your translation, the whole law and the prophets. All of the Torah and the totality of the scriptures in the First Testament. So I started thinking, what is loving your neighbor as yourself? I mean, doesn't Paul say you must die to self? Doesn't, aren't, the, is, aren't the scriptures pretty replete of saying, at least at a minimum, that you should almost subdue any and all tendencies of wanting something for yourself for the sake of others? So how is it that you must love your neighbor as yourself? That's really a question to think about. The reality is, is that we fail to truly accept the love of God in us to effectively even contemplate loving your neighbor as yourself. So that makes it near impossible to love ourselves, which makes it impossible to love others unconditionally because we have yet to fully look at the love of God in us, His unconditional love for us and accept it which means we're out of sync for our entire lives, almost always, because we lack a real genuine acceptance of the love of God. The love he has for us put within us to grant us the ability to love him, love ourselves, love others, is an unconditional, selfless, fulfilling, and joy-bringing love. Amen? Jesus in the Gospel of John chapter 10, verse 10 says that I came to give you life, and life what? More abundance. And often when we think of that scripture, we think, yeah, just like Martha, right? I know that my brother will rise again at the end of the age. 
Right? I know that Jesus will give me life, and he'll give me life more abundant after the second coming. But he wants to give you life and life more abundant right now. And then even more so after the second coming. Amen? Jesus says very plainly that the kingdom of God is within you so that you can experience the kingdom of heaven at the return. Amen? What does this really mean, the concept, the idea of loving your neighbor as yourself? What does it mean? How many people that you know or yourselves feel depressed, worthless, less than valuable, a cog in the machine of society, going through the motions of life? You're unhappy. You're miserable. How do you combat this? Amen. I know how you combat it, right? You start doing good works, right? You go out in the mission field, you prepare whatever it is you want to prepare and give to the homeless. You want to just do, 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 right? And you're going to continue to try and be a better person. Amen? That's how I'm going to do it. That's how I'm going to get over my feeling of worthlessness because, dang it, I might be a bad person, but I'll tell you this much, I'm going to help others. And yet from you, to me, to Mother Teresa, there is ample evidence that service-based love without the real power of love behind it is just self-righteousness. It's just self-righteousness. We rack our brains why this person or the people or your son or your daughter, your mother, your father, your husband, your wife, God doesn't love you back doesn't hear you about your needs, doesn't accept your service, your love, your effort. Why is it that there's no reciprocation? Sometimes we feel that way, right? Why don't I feel enough love? Why am I not receiving what I'm giving out in return? Why is this true? Why are we failing so often in the Christian experience? in our marriages, in the raising of our children, in our relationship with others, with God. I think about these things. Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. Right after Acts is Romans. And we're in the sixth chapter. Read this quickly here. Right before that, in verse 20 of chapter 5, Paul had said that the law came in so that transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he makes a statement, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase or abound? It's fascinating. He gives this, this picture of freedom. And then he says, this is give you a license to sin, to live a life of sinfulness. Should you continue in sin so that the grace of God can actually be increased? May it never be. Or in the King James, God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live still in it? Or do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus and have been baptized into his what, church? Okay. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism in the death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of what? Oh, a new life. A new life. For if we have become united, abide, united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. When Jesus died and was resurrected, did he receive life? When, when Jesus died and was resurrected, did he receive life? Okay, and so then when you are buried in baptism, 
in the symbol of his death, and you are raised up out of those waters, do you receive life? That's what God is promising here. New life. Life more abundant. Knowing this, that our old man, our old self, was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, no longer be servants of sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. We believe that we shall also live with him, verse 8 says. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Verse 22. But having been freed from sin and put in subjection to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification, and the outcome is eternal life. What wonderful words. Friends, when sinners look inward with clear eyes, here's the real issue about unconditional love and accepting the love of God in us, abiding with Christ, right? Having that kingdom mentality. Here's the real problem. When sinners look inward with clear eyes, frankly, we don't like what we see, right? Right? We look in the mirror, and our expression is that we don't like the way we look. We don't like the way we act. We don't like people. They tick us off. They say stupid things. Right? They fail us every step of the way. And we're upset. We don't like it. Ephesians chapter 4. Quickly. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 through 24. Ephesians chapter 4. So after Galatians is Ephesians, stuck in between Galatians and Philippians. 4, verse, Ephesians 4, verses 20 through 24. The Bible says this, But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, the old man, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on a new self which is in the likeness of God and has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Did you catch that? I want you to focus on this last part in verse, verses 23 and 24. Think of it. The commandment that Jesus says is that you should love your neighbor as your what? Okay, and then if you're corrupted, right, if you look at yourself and all you see is flaws and a disconnection from the Most High and that you live a life that is unbecoming of a Christian, are you tracking with me? How can you really love your neighbor as yourself? Here's the formula. That you are renewed in the spirit of your mind. And your old self is bad. And remember, it's crucified with Christ. So that this can happen. God does this for you on your behalf. Right? Verse 24. Put on a new self, which is in the likeness of who? God, are you sure it's not in the likeness of your former self? Are you positive, church? So put on a new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So how can you love your neighbor as yourself? By putting on a new self. Accepting the unconditional love of God within you, abiding. That's the truth. That's the truth. Continues. 2 Timothy, but you might say, hold on now, David. This sounds crazy. I mean, we know in chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, that the love of self is not good. It only produces evil. It only produces the deeds of the flesh. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul says this, But realize this, this is verse 1, that in the last days, are we living in the last days? Difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of what? So why will I have to love my neighbor as myself? And he's saying that this is bad. Listen to it. They're going to be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than the lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. A form of godliness. You know what the issue really is? They never received the new self. They loved all of those things and not the unconditional love of God. And you know what the truth is about this person who loves himself in this manner that Timothy is talking about here, that Paul wrote to Timothy? He's miserable. He's miserable. His heart aches on a daily basis. I know this because I've been there. And I suspect some of you have too. So to truly love yourself is accepting first the unconditional love of God for you and in you. Amen? So what do you have to accept? What has to change for you to truly experience real self-love? If you have to love your neighbor as yourself, right? I mean, you may have had these thoughts, right? I'm too thin. I'm too fat. I'm ugly. I'm not smart enough. I'm too sinful. We're unforgiving to ourselves and to others, right? How about this? You're hateful. You're rude. Self-centered. Because everything you do is to get something in return. Remember that transactional love? You always say inappropriate things. You put people out there. You gossip. You marginalize people. You're mean-spirited. You're not good enough. You don't deserve it. You don't deserve true love. You don't deserve happiness. You don't deserve financial security. You don't even deserve your needs met. Have you thought about these things before? Have they swirled through your head? On some level, even when you were a child, the inadequacies of yourself has been brought forth. And you loathe it. That's the truth. We hate the human experience. You know, the two kids that went to Columbine and shut up the school and, write, and reading his writings, he was very vehement that the human race needed to be exterminated because there just was no love in it. That was his purpose, to try to commit one student at a time. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake. Listen to that part. God blots out your sins, your transgressions, for your sake, for my own sake, and I will not remember thy sins. What does this give you permission to do? If you've had these thoughts of feelings that you don't deserve it, you're not good enough, you can't experience happiness and true love, you're too sinful, so on and so forth, right? Here's what God gives you permission to do. He says, I've forgiven you all of your transgressions. I blotted them out for my sake. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. Because I already have. Forgive others. Right? Isn't that part of the Lord's Prayer? Forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive others. Because guess what? The people who have sinned against you, God has already forgiven them. And he's given you the power to do it as well. Let it go, whatever is holding you back. Start clean every day if you have to. Every day if you have to. Remember in 1 John 4 it says, In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Accept the love of God, his forgiveness, and allow it to work through you and in you. In Romans 5, 8, it says, But God commandeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Friends, that is unconditional love. It's the very definition of unconditional love. He had no expectation that you would return the love unto him. It says, while you were still yet sinners, carnally minded, and at the moment against him, he sent his son to die for you. In Romans 8, 1 through 9, it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So how much room for condemnation are, for the, are those in Christ Jesus? How many people who are in Christ Jesus stand condemned? How many? Nobody. This pastor told us earlier that he bore all of our sins. The ones right now, the ones in the past, and the ones in the future, all of them. Right? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, through that old self, God did, sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh, the carnal mind, is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile, enmity, hatred towards God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. And so that's a lot of spirit and flesh language Paul's getting on there, right? Could get a little confusing. So what does it mean to live in the flesh? What does it mean to be dead versus being alive, right? That's really the comparison that's going on here. Are you alive in the spirit or are you dead in the flesh? Here's something that's interesting. Um, I'm vegetarian. doesn't matter. Uh, and some people here, I'm sure, eat meat. Fantastic. Meat is such a perfect metaphor for human life. It's true. Meat is a perfect metaphor for human life that has become dehumanized. Because what is meat but dead life? Truly, what is meat besides dead life? I mean, do you eat the cow while it's still alive? How about the chicken? Just kind of lift that wing up and <laughs> take a bite out of them? Is that how it works? No, you got to kill it first, right? And hopefully cook it through, otherwise you might get salmonella. Okay? Meat is dead life. Meat is always a once living animal that got killed for the sake of consumption. Did you hear that? Meat is always a once living animal that got killed for the sake of consumption. It died to provide a need, which is food, so that you can eat it. True or false? It's the reduction of life to a consumable object. Are you tracking with me? We're talking about walking in the flesh, being dead, and living in the spirit, being in life. So I'll repeat it one more time just so you can let it marinate on you. Meat is such a perfect metaphor for human life that has become dehumanized because meat is dead life. Remember what does Paul say? Flesh is death. Flesh is dead life. Okay? Meat is always a once living animal that got killed for the sake of consumption. Living according to the flesh is dead life for the sake of consumption. It's the reduction of life to a consumable object. Are you living a life of the flesh, the life of meat? It's only a matter of time before one feels as if their life has been reduced and dehumanized to the point where they are dead life only existing to be consumed by others. That's a frightening realization. Are you living your life according to the flesh only to be consumed by others? 
When we get to the point where we feel burnt out, we feel like we're dead inside, when we are full of resentment that your life exists simply to be consumed by others, that should be the wake-up call. Are you living in unconditional love? Or are you dead flesh, meat, to be consumed by others? Three steps to obtaining unconditional love of God for yourself, for God, and for others. Step number one, accept the fact that you are born with a sinful nature. It's true. Born with bad, bad mechanisms that you are naturally inclined to evil. That you want to put yourself over at the expense of others. Then realize, as the text said, that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. That the love of God was manifested in that God set his son as a sacrifice for your sins so that you could not have death, dead meat, but life. That he has bore and forgiven you and others who have wronged you on your behalf already. Accept that. Step one. Step two. God has the ability to create you into a new creature. What do you say? Based on his life and his works and his character, God is love. And he wishes to dwell in you in the fullness of love so that you can actually fulfill and act in being love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. It doesn't brag. It's not arrogant. It doesn't act unbecomingly. It doesn't seek its own. It's not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails because God doesn't fail. Walk according to the Spirit and crucify the old man and walk in the newness of life. Step two, become the love of God. He's giving it to you. Walk in the newness of life. Step three, you've already accepted God's forgiving power, acknowledging that by doing this, you can accept his unconditional love for you, which means that you can stop hating yourself and start experiencing the true grace of God. You are responding to his love by loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. And God, by his mercy, knows that you will make mistakes. He knows that we still live in this world and that we will be tempted, and yet he still looks at you and calls you blameless, perfect, upright, and righteous. Now that you love yourself by living in God's unconditional love, you can love him who first loved you. And you can truly fulfill the commandment of loving your neighbor, your spouse, your children, your enemy, as yourself. Because the love you have for yourself is God's love. So return it to others, showing people, God in you, the very hope of glory. I'll close with this story. There was a father who had a daughter, his first child. He loved this little girl. And we talked about needy love in the beginning, right? So often parents, they'll just pour that unconditional love to this child, right? That's the demonstration and the, and, 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 and the story and picture that's being painted of God with us. So he wrote his daughter a letter. Dear Bristol, before you were born, I prayed for you. In my heart, I knew you would be a little angel, and so you were. When you were born on my birthday, April 7th, it was evident that you were a special gift from the Lord. But how profound a gift you would turn out to be. More than the gurgles and rosy cheeks, more than the firstborn of my flesh, a Joy unspeakable. You showed me God's love more than anything else in all of creation. Bristol, you taught me how to love. I certainly loved you when you were cuddly and cute and when you jabbered your first words. I loved you when you were searing, when the searing pain of realization took hold. That something was wrong. That maybe you weren't developing as quickly as your peers. And even when we understood it was more serious than that, I loved you when we went from hospital to clinic to doctor, looking for a medical diagnosis that would bring us some hope. And of course, we always prayed for you. We prayed and prayed. 
I loved you when you moaned and cried. Your mom and I and your sisters, we would drive for hours late at night to help you fall asleep. I loved you when you were confused. When with tears in your eyes, you would bite your fingers or your lip by accident. I loved you when your eyes crossed and then when you went blind. I most certainly loved you when you could no longer speak. And how profoundly I missed your voice. I loved you when scoliosis began to retch your body like a pretzel. And when we put a tube in your stomach so you could eat, we fed you one spoonful at a time, even up to two hours per meal. I managed to love you when you contorted your limbs and made changing 10 years of diapers difficult. Bristol, I even loved you when you could not say the one thing in life that I longed to hear back. Daddy, I love you. Bristol, I loved you when I was close to God and when he seemed far away. When I was full of faith and also when I was angry at him. When the reason I loved you, my Bristol, in spite of these difficulties, is that God put this love in my heart. This is the wondrous nature of God's love. He loves us when we are blind or deaf twisted in body or in spirit. God loves us even when we can't tell him that we love him back. An experience truly that God can relate to with us. Amen? 1 John 4 tells us that we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. We love because he first loved us. Let's pray. God, our Father. Wherever we're at in this moment, in this picture, in this landscape of life, whether it be in misery, bliss, happiness, anger, frustration, sadness, whatever it is, Lord, let us see ourselves as you see ourselves, worthy of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, worthy to have our sins forgiven, worthy to have the old man nailed to the cross, worthy to experience the newness of life, worthy to have the love of God manifested in us, worthy to walk according to his spirit. Lord, we ask and we pray that you will just please hold our hands, carry us, if you must, on the straight and narrow path so that not only can we love ourselves because you first of loved us, but that we can love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our minds so that we can truly love others unconditionally as you have unconditionally loved us as ourselves. Lord, on this season of Thanksgiving, we have gratitude for your a loving and kind Father. And we thank you for never giving up on us. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name.